Hi, and welcome to Burley United Methodist Worship Services for Sunday, the 17th of March, St. Patrick's Day. Uh, we are grateful that you could tune us in. If you are in the area today uh, and planning to come to our happiness class after worship, please stop. We were having our leadership council meeting uh, this week, but next week we will begin, uh, we will start up again our, our uh, happiness class, the, the art and science of happiness. Our opening hymn this morning comes from our uh, songbook, uh, Faith We Sing, number 2146, His Eye is on the Sparrow. The call to worship this morning is kind of out of context for Lent. It is actually Mary's Magnificat, uh, found in our United Methodist hymnal. I will read the light print, I'll ask you to respond in the bold. 
My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, who has looked with favor on me, a lowly servant. For this day, all generations shall call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is the name of the Lord, whose mercy is on those who fear God from generation to generation. The arm of the Lord is strong and has scattered the proud in their conceit. God has cast down the mighty from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. God has lifted the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. God has come to the aid of Israel, the chosen servant, remembering the promise of mercy, the promise made to our forebears, to Abraham and his children forever. Please join me in the prayer of the day. When we feel alone and forgotten, we remember, O oh God, that your chosen one felt the depths of grief and despair, despised, rejected, spat upon, and scorned. He continued to trust you and believe in the mission you prescribed. As we gather to remember, we seek the faith that triumphed over every adversity. Amen. Our next hymn, O Love Divine, What Hast Thou Done, is a poignant meditation on the cross. And the text was originally entitled Desiring to Love. Wesley placed it among the hymns of describing the goodness of God in his 1780 collection, where it served to ground and illustrate the call to repentance. It is appropriate during this season of Lent. The sense of penitential gratitude deepens with the gravity of the scene remembered and is enhanced by the rhythm of the melody. Let us sing, O love divine, what hast thou done? Prayer is the most important, I think, of all the spiritual disciplines. For it calls upon us to be quiet, to focus, to surrender, and to share. So let us do those things now. Oh God, you rob death of its sting. You cause graves to set free their captives. You assemble and enliven dry bones strewn amid barren fields. 
through the grace of the Holy Spirit, set forth Christ. Our mortal lives are aflame with your presence and redeemed by your love. You hear the voice of our prayers, inclining your ear to our needs. We give you thanks for your indulgence, your kindness and care. We owe our lives to your righteous salvation and the gift of your Son. We are the people of your compassion, your judgment, and your justice. You are our God, and we give you the praise to your name. Hear our prayer for those bones that have been brittle and dry. We pray for the aging, those in our midst whose movements are not so swift as they once were. May the breath of life that you give them be for us an abiding source of inspiration and wisdom. Give us patience to listen to what they say, and may our presence be for them a comfort as they meet each new day. Hear our prayer for those whose muscle lacks a sinew and is no longer pliable or tight. We pray for the lazy and those who are overly cautious when called upon to act. Give them a discipline that will train them in faith and may we show them a boldness tempered with patience and care. Hear our prayer for those whose flesh is different from ours because of pigment and race. We pray for sisters and brothers of all colors who give radiance to Christ's church. Assemble our diverse gifts in a vivid display of our common baptism in Christ and set ablaze the unity of our witness with the Holy Spirit who binds us as one. So breathe on us, breath of God, and fill with us life anew that we may love what you love and do what you would do. And we pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught his disciples when they prayed to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Junior high summer camp was a long time ago for me. But I do remember that one evening Rick, our cabin counselor, spoke to everyone around the campfire. He brought props, eye protection, I think 55 years ago it must have been ski goggles, a hammer, a glass jar filled with dirty water, all in a metal pail. And Rick said something like this, God is holy and just. That is why God cannot let our sins go unpunished. And with that, he put on his goggles, raised the hammer and brought it down upon the jar. The campers in the front row cringed as they shield themselves from the incoming shards of glass. At the last moment, Rick diverted the path of the hammer, causing it to miss the glass jar. He went on to say, in an act of grace, Jesus Christ came to us in order to save us from God's righteousness and most deserving wrath. Rick then took the metal pail, turned it upside down, and place it over the jar of yucky water. He said, like this bucket, Jesus Christ is our protective shield. And he then proceeded to whack the heck out of the bucket, making a terrible racket, saying God satisfied his wrath by punishing Jesus instead of us. Well, this demonstration scared a lot of kids, first physically and then probably spiritually. I'm sure that the gospel message is not. Believe in Jesus Christ so he will save you from God. As we come to Friday of Holy Week, 
I am taking a divergent course, which, after tolerating me for nearly six years, you should be quite used to. When we, as followers of Christ, come to the cross, we must be ready to confess its significance. Paul writes to the Colossians about the significance of the cross. So that you may lead your lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, as you bear fruit in every good work, and as you grow in the knowledge of God. But unlike Rick, my cabin counselor, we need to be wise enough that, to understand that the significance of the crucifixion cannot be explained with a few household items. The misconception of the cross comes from our inadequate understanding of Jesus Christ, which he sought to accomplish before Good Friday. In no way what I'm telling you that what you know about the crucifixion is wrong. Rather, what I'm telling you is that what you know about the crucifixion is not 100% complete. There's more to it. And so I'd like to go back into the future, like Christopher Lloyd and, and his movie, to focus on an incident far removed from the halls of power in Jerusalem, to Jesus' hometown of Nazareth. Neither do I want to focus on the Friday of Holy Week, but rather to go back to the beginning when our Lord's publicly declared what his messianic mission was to be all about. Those who heard Jesus' words that they were initially captivated and drawn to Jesus, they would, they would, by the time he sat down would be furious at what he said. Our call to worship this morning comes from Luke's gospel, Mary's Magnificat. Mary spoke about her son toppling rulers from their thrones. And last Christmas, Betty Lane spoke about Anna and Simeon and how Simeon had been introduced to the baby Jesus, referring him to as the Messiah and the glory of Israel. And Simeon's words will be our benediction. With all those anticipations after his baptism, Jesus ventures into the wilderness to, conflict the, to confront the devil. Endowed by the Spirit, Jesus returns home to Nazareth, where in his home synagogue, everyone turns out to see the local boy who made good, and he opens the Isaiah scroll and reads these words from Isaiah, from Luke 4, starting with verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And after reading this very famous messianic passage, he sits down and he says, today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Imagine if you were there. You might have heard people asking the person sitting next to them, is Mary and Joseph's son saying what I think he is saying? In a small town like Nazareth, like the TV show Cheers, where everyone knows your name, there might have been some elderly folk thinking and nodding. Then those rumors of Mary's son are true. He is the Messiah. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that had come from his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? The people of Nazareth felt this way because they believed what they were the ones whom Isaiah wrote about. They were gracious because they thought Jesus was talking about them. 
We are the poor who have been oppressed. We are the ones imprisoned by Rome. The year of the Lord's favor is the year of Jubilee, which happens every 75 years, where all the property gets restored to its original owners, and all of those who are imprisoned or enslaved or set free. So no wonder the people of Israel, and especially the people there in Nazareth, thought so highly of their boy wonder. He was going to win them their freedom. What Jesus had shared so far was pleasing to their eyes, but then he went on to clarify his messianic mission. Truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is there are many widows in Israel during the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land, yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a Gentile widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman, the commander of the Syrian army. Jesus said, I came not just to benefit you. I came to benefit and minister to those who are marginalized, to those who live on the edges of society, the foreigner, the widow, the one like Elijah helped, and the leper, Naaman, the one who Elisha healed. Like, like what happened to Barnabas and Paul in Lystra, when the local folk initially thought that they were pagan gods in human form until, until Paul convinced them that the two of them were the men, and then they attacked Paul, and they sought to kill him. And the same thing happened to Jesus in his hometown. And when they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove Jesus out of town, and led him to the brow of a hill in which they were about, their town was built, so they might hurl Jesus off the cliff, but he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. If only Jesus had come to earth to die for our sins so that we might have life, then he wouldn't need to accomplish that mission. All that Jesus needed was just that first week. He could have showed up like he did here in Luke 4, preach a contentious and controversial message, infuriate his leaders and die right there that day. To have died that way, he would have had, uh, on the outskirts of Nazareth, would have been significant. Every year during the Jewish High Holy Days is the Day of Atonement, where the Jewish people collectively make amends for their sin. The high priest takes a goat, lays his hands upon the animal's head, and confesses all the sins of the people of Israel, transferring them onto the goat. The animal then would be taken into the wilderness to be left there alone and die. Over the centuries, some goats were very cooperative in dying. If they had a, but if they had a good sense of direction and a good amount of self-preservation, the goat would show up in the city the next day or two, much to the chagrin of the local priest or rabbi. In time, a remedy was sought of how to take care of this goat, and the goat would be tossed off a cliff. So if dying for our sins was Jesus' sole mission, then being tossed off a cliff would have been ideal. He would have been memorialized as the perfect scapegoat who bore our sins and died in our place. But going any further down this rabbit hole, we run the risk of kneeling at the base of a cliff or tattooing on our arms 
goats or having people like me pitching billy goats off the church roof. The significance should not be lost that Jesus had the opportunity to die like a scapegoat on the day of atonement, but he chose instead to lay down his life at Passover, taking on the role of the sacrificial lamb. But when the crowd in Nazareth tried to kill him, he simply walked right by them and left them. Apparently, that wasn't the right time. There was more for him to accomplish before he would lay down his life. In one of the great I Am statements, I think Jesus lays out the three elements of his earthly messianic mission. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Yes, Jesus did die for our sins so that we might have eternal life. But Jesus came also to show us the way and about the truth of God. And it will be these last two elements that our Lord focuses on in the most of the three years of his ministry. At Christmas, at Christmas we are reminded what it means to live as a child of God. Not only did Jesus die for us, but he also taught us how to live. The story of Good Friday, found in all four Gospels, takes up a significantly small amount of ink. I think what the point here is that, yes, while the cross is more than just what something Jesus endured for our sake, it is also the end result of a way of living that we are called to imitate. Jesus also came to set the record straight about God, and we read about that in the book of Hebrews. Jesus is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustained all things by his powerful word, when he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. In his letter to the Colossians, Paul wrote that the image of God is like what the image of God is like when he wrote. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. If you want to know what God is like, if you want to discover God's heart and character, look to Jesus. When we overlook this core part of Christ's mission, we risk explaining what happened on the cross in pity God the Father against God the Son. This was what Rick did during his campfire slash demonstration which is not good theology. For John wrote, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And Paul wrote to Corinth, that is in Christ God has reconciled the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So God is not like a hammer. So then who is holding the hammer? It is interesting that Jesus read from Isaiah 61, but he stopped mid-sentence. He did not complete Isaiah's thought to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of God and to comfort all who mourn. Jesus left off the reference to God's divine judgment against Israel's enemies. Normally, we shouldn't make too much of an omission. Our Lord had to stop somewhere from reading Isaiah's scroll. 
Yet this is not the first time when he omitted referring to divine vengeance, quoting scripture, he revealed that his mission would be the furthest thing from God's vengeance. While Elijah and Elisha were not exactly cut from the same bolt of cloth as the Messiah, for rarely did these Old Testament prophets show mercy to outsiders. Elijah slaughtered the prophets of Baal, all 450 of them. Elisha too took, Elisha as well took things personally, sometimes too personally at times. Once he cursed a group of teenagers making fun of his bald head. So it is significant that our Lord would use Elijah and Elisha as paragons of virtue. Christ's mission is one of virtue and mercy, not vengeance. Likewise, he calls the church to follow a similar path. There is a growing movement in the United States calling, called Christian nationalism, which is gaining traction in Protestant churches. This fascist ideology is based upon vengeance of those who speak differently than us, who look differently than us. Rather than being devoted to the gospel of mercy and love, getting even with those who have wronged us is both healing for us and then which should always be our goal. Our aim is to treat others in ways that promote their healing and their wholeness. Living with a spirit of mercy makes all the differences in the world. The world's message is loud and clear. Undocumented immigrants don't deserve our help. The biblical message is always one of offering mercy to the stranger in our midst. Throughout my military career, I have debated the topic of just war numerous times with my fellow chaplains. And my stance has been and will always be that while wars may be justifiable, war is never merciful. For we are called to be merciful just as God is. On a dangerous sea coast where shipwrecks often occur, there was once a crude little life saving station. The building was just a hut, and there was only one boat, and a few devoted members kept a constant watch over the sea with no thought for themselves, and they went out night and day tirelessly searching for the lost. Some of those who were saved and various others living in the surrounding community wanted to become associated with the station and give up their time and money and effort for the support of this work. And new boats were brought in and new crews trained. The little life-saving station grew. Some members of the life-saving station were unhappy that the building was so crude and poorly equipped. They felt a more comfortable place would be provided as the first refuge of those saved from sea. They replaced the emergency cots with beds and put better furniture in the enlarged building. And now the life-saving station became a popular place for its members and they decorated it beautifully and furnished it exquisitely because they used it as sort of a club. Fewer members were now interested in going to sea on life-saving missions. So they hired lifeboat crews to do the work. 
The life-saving motif still prevailed in this clubhouse decoration, and there was a miniature lifeboat in the room where the club initiations were held. About this time, a large ship wrecked off the coast, and the hired crews brought in boatloads of cold, wet, half-drowned people. They were dirty and sick, and their skins were either black or brown. The beautiful new chaos, the beautiful new club was in chaos. So the property committee immediately had a shower, built a shower house built outside the club where victims of shipwreck could be cleaned up before coming inside. At the next meeting, there was a split in the club membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-giving, life-saving activities since they were unpleasant and a hindrance to the normal social life of the club. Some members insisted upon life-saving as their primary purpose and pointed out that that's where there was still called a life-saving station. They were finally voted down and told that if they wanted to save lives of all the various kinds of people who were shipwrecked in those waters, they should begin their own life-saving station somewhere else. As the years went by, the new station experienced the same changes as the old. It evolved into a club, and yet another life-saving station was founded. History continues to repeat itself, and if you visit that sea today, you will find a number of exclusive clubs along the shore. Shipwrecks are frequent in those waters, but very few life-saving boats goes out to look for survivors. Let us pray. As we look upon your cross, O Christ, filled with wonder and with awe, at the love that brought you to it, humbly we confess that we have no offering meet for such a love, no gift fit for a sacrifice. You were willing to go to the cross so that women and men might forever be haunted by its sign, might return to the foot of the cross to be melted and broken down in the knowledge of your love for us. When we see a love like that, the love of God yearning for the hearts of his children, we only know that love can respond. We acknowledge, O oh Lord, that there is so little in us that is lovable. So often we are not lovely in our thoughts, in our words, or in our deeds. And yet you still love us with a love that neither ebbs nor flows, a love that does not grow weary, but is constant year after year. Oh God, may our hearts be opened to that love today with bright skies above us, fields and woods and gardens bursting with new life and beauty how we can pray be able to respond with clear notes of bird songs challenging us to praise with very low shrubs and blooming trees catching new life and beauty our hearts indeed would proclaim you O lord and we would invite you to reign over us and make us truly yours may your healing love invade our innermost parts healing sorrow pain frustration defeat and despair all of these things we pray in the name of your son, Jesus, and all of us people said, amen.
final hymn this morning is softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. You will see in the first stanza of this hymn expresses an image of Jesus similar to that of the father of the parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15. Jesus is patiently waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. The following stanzas speak of the urgent need for repentance and mercy, pardon, and the love that Christ offers. The refrain welcomes prodigals home, which is all, which is what all of us need. Let us sing softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling.
And our benediction today is from the words found in the words of Luke as he quotes Simeon. Let us go now. Lord, let your servants go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. Our own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the presence of all your people, a light to reveal to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. May we take these words of Simeon home with us this day and every day. Go in peace.